Tonight on the Fanatic Forum, we've got geek news, new comic books, and our final pair of Fanatic favorites, two crime noir films that couldn't be any more different from the usual stuff. We're going to talk about Brick and Pulp right after this. Happy Friday and welcome to the Fanatic Forum. I'm your fanatic and host, your prime fanatic and host, George Bueller. Hope everybody's had a good week out there. Uh, it basically, if you're watching this live, you know we are uh, at the cusp of Christmas here. Uh, Monday is the day here, so uh, I'm actually um, I'm on location at Clobbering Comics here in Elizabethtown. This is my actual place of employment, if you guys don't know. I've talked about the shop before. Uh, I've had to work today, so uh, basically just closed up the store literally uh so i'm here now i'm gonna to talk to you guys so been a busy day here lots of good christmas shopping being done here so it was pretty cool uh but of course we have got a couple of big news uh things to talk about here definitely in the marvel universe uh on the lighter side of things just now streaming on disney plus season two of what if uh is premiered today so looking very forward to checking that out I'm watching uh avengers movies and endgame all day here in the shop so yeah i'm all geared up here on the other hand, though, we finally have a definitive answer on the Jonathan Majors situation. Uh, of course, if you guys have been very well aware going on, uh, Jonathan Majors was brought up on charges of uh, domestic abuse, battery, you know, terroristic threat, all kinds of all, all sorts of bad stuff here. Uh, he was found guilty on some of those charges. Not 100% sure if he's going to spend any jail time or not. Uh, Kind of the experts are saying maybe not, uh, but there could be still a possibility. But what is definite is that Jonathan Majors is out as Kang for the MCU. So at this point right now, that is all we know. Uh, as I've talked before in previous weeks, Marvel does have a plan in place. They basically had a few options they gave themselves. One, the simple one is just to recast him. Uh, keep the storyline going that they're doing for the next couple of Avengers movies and just cast a different actor as, Jonathan, as, as Kang. which. I don't see any problem with at all. We've recast Rhodey. We've recast the Hulk twice. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't see any problem with our majors being recast. So we'll see. Um, the other option would be to basically take out Kang a little early or maybe, you know, what happened at the end of season two of Loki may kind of fix that for us possibly. Uh, so we could be rid of him kind of a little bit anticlimactically. But uh, on the other hand, though, perhaps the incursions are still happening and maybe they're going to bring in Dr. Doom a little bit earlier to come in and basically save us all from, uh, or, you know, from death and destruction. And then basically he remakes the world in his own image. So we could, you know, definitely go into the 2015 Secret War storyline with that. But at this point, there are so many, what ifs, no pun intended. Uh, so we're just kind of seeing what's going to happen here. But I'm sure probably, uh, you know, after the first of the year, we're going to get a little bit of an answer. But the definite Jonathan Majors as Kang is no more. So we'll see what happens from there. But we've been kind of waiting. Uh, so, yeah. So <laughs> we, we have our answer now. So, yeah, we'll see. Um, it's like I said, it's an unfortunate situation uh, where real life has to catch up with stuff. But basically, hey, you know. Jerks like that should not get rewarded for bad deeds by keeping their job. So, yeah, Marvel did the right thing by waiting. You know, they, they learned their lesson with the whole Johnny Depp situation by pulling the plug too quickly. So they waited until basically a verdict was made. And once it was made, there you go. So we shall see from there. But, yeah, uh, of course, more geek news. Uh, part one of Rebel Moon, Zack Snyder's new film. That's on Netflix today. Lots of good stuff is streaming right now. Uh, the uh, new Exodus movie is out on Peacock, I believe. Uh, Hulu has The Creator, which I was looking forward to checking that out. So lots of cool stuff. So 
plenty of reasons to stay at home and watch TV during the holidays. There you go. Uh, and actually, I finally got around to watching Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which is on Disney Plus right now. I admit I was wrong, folks. I skipped that one in the theaters entirely. I had no intention of seeing it. I didn't have a lot of faith in it. It's not great, but it's pretty good. And it's definitely a hell of a lot better than the Crystal Skull. So thumbs up for Dial of Destiny. It's, like I said, it's not perfect, but it's fun. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. <laughs> but yeah, I had a lot of my doubts on that one. All right, well, we got a whole bunch of new comic books to talk about here. Uh, and I've actually got, I don't do it often, but I got one I got to trash a little bit here. I got, I got a beef with one particular book that came out this week. But not this one here. My one pick from Marvel this week, absolutely love, Spine Tingling Spider-Man Issue 3. Of course, this is a horror story that is in the Spider-Man universe here. So we don't really get a lot of spooky uh, Spider-Man stuff here. But this one takes the cake. Uh, of course, uh, Saladin Ahmed uh, does the art in here. Uh, of course, or not, he does the writing, which, of course, we know him from Miles Morales. And he's currently writing the new Daredevil book. Uh, and then uh, Mon Ferreira does the art in here. Killer stuff. Just fits the storyline really well. Uh, issue three, we might actually finally get an answer as to who has been terrorizing Spider-Man and to what lengths this person has gone to terrorize Spider-Man. And it's been some extraordinary lengths, let me tell you. But the the puzzle pieces do fit. So, yeah, and of course, we get maybe a little tease on the front cover here. Like, you know, who, who's this guy right here? <laughs> uh, next up, we got a bunch of picks from DC Comics here. Uh, of course, uh, I've been talking about this. Uh, DC is doing facsimile reprints of the Batman Year One storyline. So, of course, uh, starting in 404, now we're in Part 3, which is Batman 406. And before the end of the year, we will actually get the final part of this. Um, the thing I love about these is usually when they do the facsimile reprints, uh, they put them on a little bit glossier paper. But for some reason, year one, they've been doing on uh, newsprint style paper. So it's got a little bit of a rougher texture to it. It absorbs the ink a bit more, I think. Uh, it definitely absorbs the, much more of those darker colors that are all over David Mazzuccioli's, uh art here. So. Yeah, and actually, issue three is one of my favorites of the series. So, yeah, I, I had to pick that one, too. But, yes, i just been absolutely – I love that DC's been busting out a ton of facsimiles recently. Marvel has done a few this year, but they've been a little bit lighter. DC's been a lot heavier. So, I mean, we've got, like, Batman 5 is on stands right now. Uh, the Doom Patrol issue that was the first introduction of Beast Boy is out. Uh, of course, you know, the Batman Year One series is out. So, yeah, lots and lots of stuff. And, of course, there's a lot more to come for next year, too. Uh, issue number two of Batman Offworld uh, released this week. Still still enjoying this one thoroughly here. Uh, basically, of course, this is taking place in the earlier days of Batman. But he basically has booked himself a one-way ticket out to the far reaches of the galaxy to learn how to fight aliens, hand-to-hand -hand combat style. Uh, he realizes that basically there's a lot tougher things out there than him. And uh, so this uh, Tamaranian lady on the front cover here, she's definitely one of them. That is not Starfire, but she is of her uh, species so, or, or you know, home world or whatnot. So, but yeah, that's that's not Starfire. <laughs> uh, this one's a little bit more rough and tumble of a lady here. But, yeah, uh, it's Jason Aaron's first uh, DC book he's done. It's his first Batman book, and it's just it's great. I'm really enjoying it here. I'm Definitely hope he does some more, for sure. Uh, next up here, issue four of Green Lantern War Journal. Of course, this follows the exploits of Green Lantern John Stewart. Uh, and he's having some trouble with this uh, being called the Revenant Queen, where she is basically uh, kind of possessing former dead lanterns, uh, attacking Stewart, trying to get him as well. Uh, and basically half his body is kind of possessed with this kind of, almost kind of like a sickness, a virus sort of thing that the Revenant Queen infects in people. Uh, but he is attempting to forge his own ring because, as we know, all of the Earthbound Lanterns are marooned on Earth currently. They are kicked out of the Green Lantern Corps. Uh, so Hal's on Earth. He's got enough power to basically have his own ring that he created with his own willpower, whereas John is actually going to physically create his own ring. So... Basically, what that means is he essentially will have the power of two rings, and he thinks his you know, his plan is basically two rings could overpower the Revenant Queen's infection and bring him back normal before basically she overpowers him entirely. But 
excellent, excellent issue. Still really been enjoying this book so far. So yeah, highly recommend checking that one out, especially if you're a John Stewart fan. Uh, last pick for our DC books here, Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong number three. Uh, this one, finally for Kong fans, our big monkey boy has entered the fray. We've had two issues so far. We have saw Godzilla and a lot of other different kaiju, but, God's, uh, but Kong has not shown himself yet, and here he is. So, uh, of course, the plot line of this one is that the Legion of Doom uh, go to Superman's Forces of Solitude to basically raid it for tech, weapons, whatever they can get their hands on. And basically, there's a couple of them that don't really know what they're doing, and they mess around with some... Some of Superman's toys in there, and what they do is they put themselves kind of in a warp right onto Monster Island, where all the kaiju are, and then when they try to get off, they take all the kaiju with them. So now all these, you know, Godzilla, Kong, all these other kaiju are either on Earth or they're still on Monster Island with a gate wide open they can pass through. Uh, so at this point right now, you've got Green Arrow, who's by himself on Monster Island, trying to keep Kong and the rest of the others back from the uh, basically getting into our world. Uh, so he's having a rough issue. But if you're a big Green, Lantern, or Green Arrow fan, yeah, Ollie's got a good showing in this issue here. So uh, I think this was supposed to be a six-issue miniseries. But yeah, just again, if you're a Godzilla and Kong fan, you want your superheroes fighting big kaiju, that's this book. Uh, of course, we got a bit of a cliffhanger here because issue two, Godzilla and Superman were tangoing and... Uh, Godzilla blasted Superman with a full-on direct blast of his radiation breath. So Superman's not dead, but he's hurting real bad. Because uh, while, granny, he normally is immune to solar radiation, as a matter of fact, it powers him up, perhaps Godzilla's radiation is a little different. And so, yeah, it's it hurt Clark. So that's a big deal there. Uh, lastly, for my indie books here, I've got three good ones. And of course, I got one I want to talk about here because I had a little bit of a beef with it. Uh, but first off, the good ones here from Dark Horse Comics. This is issue two of Canary, written by Scott Snyder, art by Dan Panosian. Uh, this is a three issue series, takes place in the Old West. Uh, starts off as kind of a murder mystery sort of thing. Then you realize that basically our uh, lead character here is kind of a martial guy, has like a, you know, a big past of taking down bad guys and he's had pulp novels written about him. So he's got a bit of a, a, a you know, a reputation, whatever else. So he's investigating this basically case. He has nothing he wants to do with because it's bringing up a lot of bad uh, mojo from his past and from a previous case that may be connected. Finding out though, that basically there's a mind that is connected to all this, that perhaps Though it's kind of giving us a bit of some creepy supernatural vibes, it may be something a little more man-made. Like perhaps there's some ores, you know, in the mine, like uranium or whatever else that is turning people, perhaps infecting people in some way, making them a little crazy or nuts. Or there's been some people that have been trapped in this mine for better part of a decade, and while they look like they haven't aged, maybe they're not quite human just yet. So. Lots more to come from the finale that comes next month here. But yeah, uh, Scott's writing is excellent here. It's got a good pace to it. Uh, it's good suspense, whatever else. You're keeping it very interested. But Dan Panosian's art is really where you want to come in on. Because this is literally like if Red Dead Redemption had a comic book. The scenery is gorgeous in this. If you like your Old West stuff, big epic scenery, big landscape, stuff like that, this book is full of that stuff. So Highly recommend checking that out. Next up, issue two of The Deviant. Of course, this comes from Image Comics here and James Tinian, the fourth, who's probably the premier writer in the country, I would, in my opinion at least, but the sales don't lie to him. He's got a lot of hit books here. Uh, the Deviant tells us the story of a crazy guy in a Santa costume in the 1970s that abducted uh, homosexual men and then killed them in very uh, horrific ways, sometimes would like hang them from Christmas trees. And so pretty gruesome stuff here. So the guy was caught, put in jail. Uh, and now the modern day, we've got a comic book writer who basically wants to do a comic about the whole story. And so he's interviewing the guy in murder for, you know, basically for all the murders. He's interviewing people that were, uh, you know, survived his attacks, uh, you know, victims, people from the town at that time that were caught up in the whole story, all that sort of thing. Meanwhile, there's someone 
who is committing the murders again in the modern day, but the gentleman who did it has been in jail for 30 years. So who's this new guy? Yeah. And also our, uh, our budding writer may be getting in a little too deeper into the dark stuff than he thought he was here. So yeah, really cool. Uh, <laughs> well timed because it's a Christmas story because we're, you know, we're doing Christmas stuff here, but yeah, real creepy stuff here. Good, good, good. Uh, on the lighter side of things here, this is G.I. Joe issue 302. Uh, of course, G.I. Joe, a real American hero, brought back by Image Comics. Larry Hama is back on the book, uh, literally continuing his storyline from his run from IDW Comics. So if you read issue 300, you haven't picked up 301, uh, second printings are available now because, of course, we sold out of those really quickly, but those are available. Uh, and then 302 just came out this week. Fantastic issue here. Uh, we have lost a Joe. Uh, we lost him in the last issue here. So basically, he's got a funeral uh, in this issue. Of course, we find out more of what's going on uh, with Cobra Island and basically Serpentor, his followers being mutated. And then, of course, we've got basically the Blue Ninjas from Revanche know what's going on with Cobra Island. And now Cobra Commander has basically got back to... He, he's escaped, he escaped Cobra Island before he got mutated is now back with Cobra. It's like, okay, what are we going to do about all these guys now? Uh, so a lot of that stuff going on. Uh, also for Snake Eyes fans, I don't want to spoil too much here, but you know that now we have basically three Snake Eyes in the G.I. Joe universe here. But OG Snake Eyes has himself a big moment here in the comics, and you'll know it when you see it. But um, Larry's art is fantastic. Uh, and then uh, Chris Mooneyham... Uh, is doing the uh, the interior art. Of course, Andy Kubert does the A covers here, which, good God, these are just, look at that, just awesome. Uh, but Chris Mooneyham does the interior art. And of course, Chris has a very uh, pulp style, very kind of a gritty, realistic kind of feel to his books. And I never knew I needed it so much in a G.I. Joe book. But it adds so much more realism and depth to it, uh, especially, like I said, the funeral scene. Uh, of course, it's very dramatic because it's raining, and so, you know, of course, it's a military funeral, so they're giving them the full treatment and flag folding and all that kind of stuff, but it's, like, just mm, so, so good. <laughs> and lastly, this is the one I got a problem with here. Issue number four and the finale to Hunt for the Skinwalker by Boom Studios here. Of course, this is based on the book of the same name. And, of course, the very famous case of uh, alien, you know, basically aliens threatening a, a family farm, killing their livestock. They feel watched, threatened, whatever the case may be. We finally get some experts coming in to investigate. Uh, but, of course, as typically happens, the experts find nothing. Nothing happens while they're there. But then basically kind of like when everybody's packing up, we get the one thing that happens wherever else. Uh, the problem, though, this is only a four-issue series. Issue three was the first time we get the investigators popping in. So basically, the first two issues, we're just dealing with the family and their you know, recount of the events that happened to them. Then we get the experts coming in a little bit towards the end of the issue here. So issue four is our finale. We don't get much of a resolution. Everything feels rushed. And the ending just kind of peters out. Like, you know, not even giving us an option, like maybe we're going to get more story later on, or there's going to be a second volume or whatever the case may be. No, it's just kind of like, yeah, they didn't find anything. And uh, yeah, there's so there's some weird aliens out there. And yeah, maybe they're still watching us. It's just completely inconclusive, very anticlimactic, just horribly, horribly disappointing. And this series started off fantastic. You guys remember four months ago, I talked about how awesome the first issue was. And it was. Second issue was good, too, but I was kind of like, okay, third issue, not much happened, and we're kind of getting the rest of our cast thrown in kind of late. It's like, I, well, there's four, issue four going to be a little bit larger? No, same size as the others, but just, yeah. So, and that, of course, that's a great Martin Simmons cover. Um, but just, yeah, uh, Valeria Baruzzo's art, uh, Jason Wardy uh, also did the inking in here. Their art is fantastic. It's been very consistent throughout the whole book. I have no problem with that. But Zach Thompson's the writer, and it just feels like everything got rushed uh, in that last issue. So it's just like, yeah, it's just, it's just a complete and total letdown. So I was very disappointed in that. So I hope we get another volume of stuff. I know uh, James Tinian did the uh, series for Dark Horse Comics, Blue Book, 
which was based off the uh, recounts from that were basically recounted to the United States Air Force of alien abductions, alien encounters, whatever else. So that four issue series was excellent. Of course, the art style had was a black, white, and blue texture to it. So it looked very moody, very awesome. Uh, next year, we're going to get Blue Book 1947. So we get a sequel to that one. As far as we know, no more Hunt for the Skinwalker. So yeah. Uh, I, I may go back and try to find the actual book and read that and see if it kind of ends the same way. But yeah, just the comic, very disappointing ending there. So not good at all. All right, we got one comment up here. Oh, Bill Doris, greetings from Gulfport. Happy holidays, Fanatic Forum. Thank you very much, Bill. And of course, last night on Smokes and Road Beers, uh, you guys saw that uh, Bill and Seth had their end of the year show as well. And uh, Seth was not wearing a shirt through the whole time. So basically his only fans was kind of... Uh, creeping into his podcast a bit. Uh, and I got I got love Seth's commitment, man. He was shirtless through the whole show. And he said, yeah, I was getting cold by the end of the night. <laughs> but yeah, if you guys have not checked out the Smokes and Road Beers podcast, do yourself a favor. You can find it on Facebook. You can find it on Rumble. And I think they do post their uh, episodes of YouTube uh, later on. But they're live on Facebook and Rumble. So yeah, Thursday night, 630 uh, Eastern. Definitely check those boys out because they're my friends here. And uh, they put on a good show. All right, we are going to take a break real quick for our sponsor, Comic Books for Kids. When we come back, we got some movies to talk about. We'll be back in a sec. Comic Books for Kids provides comic books to kids in hospitals and cancer centers across the U.S. It's a place where we can all work together to make sure every child has a comic book. 100% of all proceeds go towards the kids. It's about making a difference, and while they're in the hospital, allowing them to fly like a superhero, battle dragons, or rescue teddy bears. We are in every state in the country and now support over 160 hospitals. Every month, we add more. Visit cb4k.org. And of course, I've talked about you guys uh, to you all before about this uh, for uh, this year's Multiverse Fundraiser, which basically the Serial Box Network puts on a fundraiser every January where we're basically we're live the whole weekend. Uh, so you get to see all your favorite shows in the whole in the same weekend with lots of special celebrity guests, uh, wherever else. So that's going to be July or January 26th, 27th and 28th. Uh, my show on the 26th, we're going to be an hour earlier than we normally are, but I get to uh, interview Marvel legend Bob Hall, who basically did more than a few covers that uh, basically anybody of the late 70s, early 80s, especially if you're a Marvel fan, you've probably got a lot of Bob's covers. He did tons of Avengers, West Coast Avengers, Marvel Team Up, G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, the list goes on and on. Then he worked later for Valiant and Acclaim, uh, some other indie stuff. So, yeah, we're going to have a lot to talk about with Bob. Uh, I can't wait for that. Uh, but the main point is that we are uh, we always pick a charity every year to basically donate all the money to. And this year is Comic Books for Kids. Uh, and it's perfect because we've got a lot of comic book guests this year, uh, a lot of different creators of you know all different types. So we got some really fun stuff coming up for you guys this year. Uh, so definitely check out the Multiverse Fundraiser when it happens. And, of course, if you guys donate, you can be eligible for door prizes as well. So you get a little something back for giving. So, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. All right. So our final fanatic favorites for uh, the year of 2023 here, because uh, we're not going to do a show next week. Uh, we're going to take another week off for the holidays. But then we come back uh, the week after and... We'll be rocking and rolling all kinds of new episodes and uh, new guests and all that jazz here. Because I've been doing the last few weeks just by myself, just kind of taking it a little bit easy. That's all right. But, of course, I you, you know, put this up to good use here because I want to talk about you know my favorites with being in you know TV, especially a bunch of movies I've talked about. Uh, so my first one we're going to talk about because we are doing uh, crime noir this week, but definitely off-kilter stuff here. So our first one here. 1972's Pulp. Now, of course, this is basically you know, probably the most obscure one I've done here. Um, of course, Michael Caine fans love this film because this was right around the time where basically he's right at the just the cusp of his stardom. Uh, he's got movies like Get Carter, The Italian Job, The Ipcris Files. So, you know, he's well, you know, established as a British film star and is starting to make his way into the States as well. So he's getting, we're getting real close to Dress to Kill and The Hand and stuff like that. So we're, yeah, like I said, getting very close to that stuff here. 
but this is directed, of course, by Mike Hodges, who you guys may remember as the director for Flash Gordon. Uh, also, uh, the Clive Owen, uh, another crime uh, uh, film that I absolutely love, Croupier. Uh, basically, that's a you know, kind of a card uh, a con movie, you know, you know, poker and stuff like that. So, yeah, really, really cool stuff there. Uh, but yeah, so, of course, this is about... Uh, almost a decade before Mike Hodges does Flash Gordon here. Uh, this uh, pulp tells the tale of a uh, salacious pulp writer, Mickey King, who basically that's who uh, Michael Caine plays. Uh, you know, dashing playboy, uh, very popular writer. Of course, is, all this stuff is, you know, murder, crime, sex, intrigue, all stuff like that. Uh, but pulp is very much a satire of a lot of you know the the crime noir the the life those writers would lead or would maybe make their audience believe they lived that life whatever the case may be and of course some of them actually you know thought they were pulp heroes themselves and try to you know fantasy and reality you know get, got a little mixed up with some of those folks but basically this is of course just like i said uh definite uh spoof and parody of a lot of that stuff here. Uh, but Mickey is hired to do a job to basically do a biography of a very famous celebrity, but they're keeping it in mystery of who he is. But it's like, hey, we're going to take you to Malta. You get to spend a month there, you know, a very nice time. You know, you, you get a nice vacation. And while you're there, you get to meet the guy and listen to the story and write the book. So there you go. Uh, so while, of course, Mickey is there, uh, it looks like somebody's trying to kill him. Uh, very weird people are kind of getting in his crosshairs, thinking he's somebody else, getting him involved in other stuff that he has no business being involved in. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, finding out that the the celebrity that he's supposed to interview uh, was a famous actor played by Mickey Rooney, as in, yeah, that Mickey Rooney, you know, America's former sweetheart. Uh of course, in the film, uh, Mickey's character is basically played a lot of gangsters in his gangster movies, but he also thinks in real life that he is a gangster. So basically, he lives like his life as the godfather. Uh, but apparently, someone's out to kill him as well. So there's all these bodies dropping around Mickey while he's trying to do this biography uh, that may or may not have some stories that perhaps some people don't want to get out that may actually be involved in the mafia. Uh, so, you know, they're kind of worried about that. So they're trying to keep things quiet, get rid of the writer, get rid of the, the subject, and everything will be fine. Uh, but, of course, like I said, just madcap stuff through and through. Uh, and also, this is one of those movies that you want to watch all the way through the credits because as the credits start rolling, the movie's still going. There's still things going on at the end. Literally, like, the last final scene uh, is a great laugh. Because basically, you know, this is not the kind of movie where the hero wins in the end and justice is served. This is the kind of movie that the bad people are still bad. They don't get punished for the stuff they do because the good guys aren't strong enough to take them down. And, but maybe, just maybe, that the book that Mickey's still working on may serve him some justice. And he and he and he, he promises he's going to get those cheeky bastards, but I don't know, maybe maybe not. But yeah, love this film. I love the way it's shot. Uh, it's definitely got that kind of uh, late '60s, early '70s kind of cool feel to it. Not, lots of style, uh, just a, a world we don't see anymore. Uh, but again, yeah, like I said, just it, this is a movie I discovered like late at night, you know, many many years ago on cable and just got stuck with it, and I've absolutely loved it ever since here. So, highly recommend checking this out. Uh, this is, uh, if you don't want to rent it, because I don't think it's, it's not streaming on any actual platforms, but it is free on YouTube. So, you can watch the whole thing on YouTube, uncut, no problems, very nice transfer of it. So, uh, yeah, so definitely can check that out. Or, of course, you can rent, the, uh, you can uh, uh, buy the DVD, uh, which is still widely available. Uh, matter of fact, I had to get a replacement copy a while back, because uh, for some reason, I don't know what happened to the old one, but it just wouldn't play. It was bad. So it was like 10 bucks. So, yeah. So not a big deal there. But, yeah, definitely uh, a, a Michael Caine film that uh, should get more, uh, you know, notoriety, but doesn't. And also an interesting thing, too, uh, the uh, British alt-rock band Pulp, uh, who's basically been around since, I guess, like the 80s. We, of course, they had a lot of big hits in the 90s and early 2000s. This is where they got the name. 
There you go. <laughs> and it kind of fits the band, too. It, it, it's interesting, yeah. Uh, our next film that we have to talk about here. Oh, I got a comment here. Let me just talk about Diggs, BTW, what's going on, sir? How you doing? Good to see you. Uh, our next film here, we're going to talk about 2015's Brick. Uh, this is probably going to go down as like one of my all-time favorite films. Um, this is Ryan Johnson's debut film. And it's that Ryan Johnson from Star Wars Episode VIII, uh, Looper, the Knives Out movies. Yeah. So this is a... The premise to this is brilliant. Because when I tell people this, if, if you're not familiar with the film... Uh, it immediately grabs them because basically this is a 1940s Dashiell Hammett style of murder mystery, crime noir sort of thing like that. It has that the very rapid pace of dialogue, some interesting slang that's thrown in, you know, a, a style, a, you know, the, again, a style that we don't see in the world except in old movies. But the interesting thing is that while there's all this other stuff that makes up the movie, the actual setting is a modern-day Southern California high school. Joseph Gordon-Levitt uh, plays Brendan, who is basically our uh, hero, kind of our uh, everyman, uh, you know, private detective, whatever else, who's a little bit, you know, he, he, get, he gets beaten up a lot in this movie. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, but essentially, he is uh, investigating the murder of his ex-girlfriend, who may have got... Uh, involved with like a uh, drug ring, whatever else, whether she was on drugs, dealing, whatever the case may be, uh, she wasn't in a good place and she was basically murdered for it. Uh, so basically this kind of begins the movie and Brendan is now basically investigating her murder. Uh, and of course, we're finding all these different characters. You've got uh, Lucas Haas, who plays the pin, as in the kingpin, uh, who's basically literally the crime lord of this whole area. He basically runs the drugs, the racketeering, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, he's in his 20s, so everybody's kind of like, ooh, he's, you know, we're all high schoolers, but he's a little bit older. But the funny thing is, there's still kind of that, Ryan kind of snaps us back into reality a little bit because at one point there's a scene takes place in the Pin's house. And you realize that's his mom's house. And she's serving them breakfast as they're kind of talking about, you know, some serious crime-ridden things. <laughs> uh, but the the score is very kind of understated, almost kind of like has kind of like a, a wind chimes kind of feel to it. So it just has a very kind of eerie, almost dream-like score to it. Uh, but yeah, just you know, like so you've got all other kind of characters in here. Um, basically the, the femme fatale, Laura, who uh, basically seems to be interested in helping out Brennan solve the case, uh, maybe has a little more involvement than you actually think. Uh, you've got basically the pin's uh, number one thug, Tug, who you find out has got a little more involvement in the case as well. He tries to help out Brandon, but he's also a bit of a thorn in his side as well. So that's kind of just the great thing. You've got all these characters all intermingling here. Some are involved, some aren't, some are helping, but some aren't that much of a help. Uh, but they all have their own agendas. No one acts like they're in high school. Everybody acts like we're just, you know, we're doing our own thing. Going to class is completely tertiary to whatever else is going on here. Uh, Richard Roundtree, Shaft himself, has a, a cameo in here as basically the uh, school's principal who seems to be working with Brendan, has a familiarity with uh, Brendan's style of uh, investigating, and is kind of giving him a little bit of leeway, but also is like, hey, i still got a school to run here, you still got classes to go to, you know, and children are basically getting killed. So, you know, let's, you know, let's try to get this wrapped up a little bit neatly before we have to actually involve the cops, sort of stuff like that. So, but again, I, I can't say enough good things about this film. The cinematography is fantastic. Uh, and just like I said, for a debut film, for a guy who basically is going to go on to do a whole lot of other cool stuff uh, that's going to make him very popular with people. I mean, maybe not the Star Wars stuff so much, but folks love Knives Out. <laughs> Glass Onion was cool, too. We got a third Knives Out movie coming up. Uh, and, of course, uh, if you haven't checked out the uh, series Poker Face that is on uh, Peacock that stars Natasha Leone, another uh, crime series written uh, by uh, Ryan Johnson. So, 
It's got his style all over it. Very cool uh, stuff. So, and of course, I, mean, I like Natasha Leone. So her getting kind of a lead role as a, a smart aleck uh, detective who basically she has the innate ability to be a human lie detector. Like, so you basically she doesn't have to do anything. She can literally tell when you're lying. It's just the talent she has. But uh, yeah, a very cool uh, crime series there by Ryan Johnson. But yeah, this is really where it all started. Before Looper, before Star Wars, before Knives Out. We had this one here. So, yeah, again, just uh, absolutely love this film. Um, uh, this one, uh, I think it was streaming. I think it may have also been on YouTube and it may have been somewhere else. Uh, why not? Uh, the DVD and the Blu-ray, not hard to get a hold of whatsoever. They're both still in print. Uh, so, yeah, if you have not seen Brick and you are a fan of Ryan Johnson, you love a good mystery, uh, whatever else. But this one, like I said, just has such a unique setting to it because – Again, modern day Southern California high school. Uh, the only adult in the entire movie is the principal of Richard Roundtree plays and the pin's mom. Everybody else are young actors. Um, so yeah, lots of good people in there. Um, I think there was a, I can't remember who it is, but there's a brief cameo of somebody famous in here who goes on to do other stuff. But um, uh, of course, uh, Emily Duravin is in here. So Lost fans know her. Uh, she's uh, unfortunately the, uh, the, the murder victim. So she's not in it too much. <laughs> she's in the right at the beginning there. Uh, but yeah, highly recommend checking that out there. So there you go. So there's my final two there for the fanatic favorites uh, going into 2024. So we'll see what uh, next year holds aside from the fanatic, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the multiverse fundraiser, of course, coming up in January. So yeah, lots of fun stuff there. But yeah, I've got a few things in the works, a few ideas in mind uh, for uh, different people trying to bring on the show, whatever else. But of course, you know, all my fans out there, the viewers, if you guys got any suggestions of people you'd like me to talk to uh, or try to get on the show here or subjects to bring up, whatever the case may be, I'm, you know I'm always here to hear you guys, hear what you guys have to say, what your thoughts and opinions are on stuff here. Because, uh, I mean, I really appreciate and love you guys tuning in every week for the Fanatic Forum here, uh, whether it's on Facebook, YouTube, or you're listening on audio platforms. Thank you very much checking out the show here and for sticking with me here uh it's been a fun couple of years and we got a lot more good stuff coming up here so uh we're going to close out this year uh by wishing you all a merry christmas uh happy hanukkah happy kwanzaa happy holidays uh to our canadian and boxing friends happy boxing day uh so yeah just happy holidays to everybody out there hope you have a safe and good one and we will see you guys in 2024 crazy to say that, but there you go. <laughs> and we will see you all next time on the Fanatic Forum. Take care, everybody.